I have seen things, things that I don't know that I wanted to see, I'll be honest, uh, things that I was forced into. I, I mean, I had just come to town to celebrate with everyone else, me and my, my two sons. And I'm sitting on the street, kind of watching this procession go by, and suddenly, right there in front of me, this man carrying a beam falls onto the road. And with my two boys sitting right there, this Roman soldier grabs me out of the crowd and tells me to pick up his beam and start carrying it down the road. Well, I didn't have a choice. It's a Roman soldier. What are you supposed to do? So I picked up the beam. Thank goodness Alexander grabbed Rufus and they followed me up the hill. And I praise God that carrying that beam was the only thing I had to do. Because I laid that beam on the top of that hill. And then they took that man and they nailed him to it. And they hung him up on that cross. And he hang up, hung up there for six hours. Undeservedly, guys, he, he had done nothing wrong from what I had heard. And he hung there. And he said a few things. He was actually pretty quiet. He, he didn't say a whole lot. But everything he said seemed to have meaning. And then, as things were starting to wind down for this guy, the whole world seemed to change around me. A few hours before he finally passed away, the sun went dark. I, I'm, I'm not talking about clouds covered the sun. I'm talking it was midday, and all of a sudden, bam! It was dark. The sun was there. You could see where it was at, but it wasn't shining. It was black, dark outside. Middle of the day, and it seemed like it was nighttime. And then that guy hanging up on the cross made one last statement, and he passed away. And the moment he passed, the earth shook like I've never felt it shake before. It shook so violently that I was standing next to a boulder and the boulder just crumbled next to me. I thought we were going to die. I thought the world was ending. It was, it was chaos. I didn't see it myself, but I heard stories about the curtain temple, the, that big curtain temple inside that, that beautiful temple that we go and worship at. I heard stories that it ripped in half. And something else I didn't experience, but I heard about, I heard that some of the old saints, the guys who had passed away, the godly men whose tombs we see when we travel through town, I heard some of them got up out of their tombs and walked around and talked to people. I'll be honest, I didn't want to experience these things. I didn't want my boys, I didn't want Alexander and Rufus to see these things. But you know what? I'm kind of glad we did. Because clearly, that man that hung on that cross, I think he was who he said he was. I think I believe. I think he was the Son of God. Because how else can you explain what I experienced? How else can you explain those things? I think I trust in that. I'd like to think that Simon, the man that we read about in the Gospels who had to carry the cross of Jesus, I'd like to think that he became a follower of Christ. There are some writings that say he did. And uh, he did experience something that we didn't get to experience. He got to see Jesus on the cross. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Simon? He's standing there, just hanging out with the crowd, kind of seeing what's going on. Jesus falls right in front of him. They grab him out of the crowd, and he picks up this beam that has the blood of Jesus on it and has to carry it for the Savior. And then he sees all of these amazing occurrences take place. I don't know about you, but if I was witnessing something and I saw the sun go dark, 
experienced an earthquake where the rocks broke apart. And I heard stories about the temple's curtain being torn in two and, and the dead rising from the grave. I don't know about you, but I'd start asking some questions, wouldn't you? That's what they experienced. That's what Simon experienced when Jesus died on the cross. And that's what we're going to look at as we conclude our series, the, the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. We're going to finish up with his last statement. So turn to Luke 23, and we're going to begin in verse 44. Luke 23, starting in verse 44. And it says this, It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Pretty interesting. Pr pretty interesting occurrence that we see taking place right here in the, the last moments of Jesus' life before he dies on the cross. You know, darkness covering the land, a great earthquake, the curtain torn in two, the dead rising from the grave, and Jesus making his final statement. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's an interesting statement because I don't know about people who die in, in Jesus' circumstances. People don't die that way a lot anymore in the, the world we live in, uh, in America. But in Jesus' last moments, he didn't cry out and say, I'm done! He, he didn't stop and say, I'm done with this, I'm finished, I'm sick of it. He didn't do any of those things. In his last breath, in his last statement, he gives his trust to his father. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I trust you and your will. I trust you and your purpose. This statement is not a statement of defeat. This statement is a statement of trust. Jesus is trusting his Father. And I think all of these things are happening. I think the darkness, the earthquake, the temple's curtain being torn in two, the, the dead rising from the grave, those are all proofs of who Jesus Christ is. That Jesus was and is the Son of God. That he was wrongly put on that cross. That he was an innocent man, a sinless man. I think those occurrences are exactly that. They are proof of the person of Jesus. God is basically, in this moment, while his son is dying, God is making a statement to us. And I don't know about you, but a God who can darken the sun and destroy the rocks that are in the area. If you've been to Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a rocky area. It's a rock bed. And so for an earthquake to come along that was so strong that it destroyed the rocks, I think I can trust the God who can darken the sun and destroy rocks because of an earthquake and can raise the dead from the grave and can tear a temple's curtain in two. We'll get to that in just a minute. We can trust that he has the power to take care of us. You see, in Jesus' most difficult moment of his life, he trusted his father. Isn't that cool? In, in the moment where he could have said anything he wanted, he showed us that his ultimate trust was in God, his father. He focuses on his relationship and his faith. And it should be a lesson to us. We can always trust God in any circumstance we're going in, good or bad. The fact is, is that God's hands will never let us go. God's hands will never fail us. God's hands 
will always care for us in our time of trouble. And God's hands, honestly, are the only hands that can provide the things that we so desperately need when we're going through those difficult times. When our physical strength is failing, when our mental and emotional strength is dying off, Jesus Christ is the only one who can provide the strength and the comfort and the peace that we need in those difficult times. He is the only one who has the power to provide when we can't. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He is giving his Father the full trust that he has. You see, when we become followers of Christ, we put our lives in God's hands, trusting and knowing that those hands will always be there for us. But God didn't just give us a bunch of great signs as proof to who his son was. He also gave us the opportunity to have a relationship with him. Now, how can I say that? Why can I say, what proof do I have to say that Jesus gives us an opportunity to have a relationship with God. Well, here's my big statement. That big idea that I always have, that one statement that if you forget everything I've said this morning, I want you to remember this. And here's what that big idea is. Knowing Him is the first step to trusting Him. Knowing Him is the first step to trusting Him. And how can I say that? It's because of the one little statement that we see in this passage in Luke 23, where it says, and the temple's curtain was torn in two. So this was no small act. This was no coincidence that the curtain in the temple was ripped in half. Uh, Let me give you a, a description of what this curtain looked like and what it was made of, uh, back then. So there are, uh, The Bible doesn't give us a description, but we've got these writings from these Hebrew scholars that lived in this time that would write commentary about what was going on in the life of the Jewish people. And three of them actually talk about this temple curtain. Let me describe what this temple curtain looked like. It was four to five inches wide. So take a shirt and imagine putting enough layers on it that it's four to five inches deep. That's how thick the fabric was of the curtain. So four to five inches thick fabric. Guys, do you remember, have you ever seen the old videos of Hulk Hogan, like ripping his shirt back in the 80s, the WWF, like, yeah! Can you, he, not even Hulk Hogan could rip this curtain. It's that thick of fabric. It says that it was 60 feet Tall and 30 inches or 30 feet wide. So 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, four to five inches thick is how big this curtain was. But one of the commentators actually says that it took 300 priests to move the curtain. Can you imagine something so big, so thick, so heavy that it took 300 young men, strong men, to just move the thing. That's what's being torn in two. There's no act of nature that could have torn this thing apart. It's only an act of God that is capable of tearing something this thick, this strong, this heavy in two. And so this curtain is ripped apart Now, why does this curtain exist? What's its purpose? So if you were to go back in time and you were allowed access inside the temple, you would find this great room called the holy place. And in the holy place were were tables and lamps and and holy objects that were there for God's ministry. Uh, And the priests would go in. uh, There were select priests that could go in and do the ministry that was, was called for within the temple. And then against the back wall... There was a huge curtain, and the curtain had these angel beings uh, stitched into them, and it was beautiful fabric. The curtain was there to separate the holy place where all these priests would work and what was called the Holy of Holies. Inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, that box 
that Moses, God commanded Moses to build, that they put the Ten Commandments in and a couple of other items. That box was in there, and it said that that box was literally the seating place of God's presence. So why did you need a curtain there? Because in the Old Testament, before Jesus came along, if a person was to look at God, he would die. God's presence, God's holiness was so perfect that a human could not stand in its presence. And so the curtain was designed to separate man from the imminent, the, the, the vast presence of God. And so you've got this holy of holies separated by this curtain, and the curtain was made very thick and very heavy, immovable, so that no one could accidentally or could sneak into the Holy of Holies. It was designed to be a strong barrier between God's presence and his people. And then Jesus dies on the cross, and in that moment, that separating barrier was ripped apart. And here's the message that God gives us in that. God tells us in that moment, before my presence was separated from you, and now through the blood of Jesus, my presence is open to you. God goes from being someone who has, we have to have an intercessor. We had to have somebody to go in and act on our behalf for God. We had to have somebody give sacrifices on our behalf. And then when Jesus dies and became the ultimate sacrifice, we no longer needed an intercessor. We didn't need to have a go-between. We didn't have to have a guy to go and do our business with God. The curtain was torn open, and we can now do business with God himself. Jesus' death gave us the presence of God. So why can I say that knowing him is the first step to trusting him? Because we can know him. Because we have the physical evidence, the curtain ripped in two, so that we could have full access to God's presence, to God's person. But we didn't have that before. And so trust comes in knowing. Uh, think about relationships that you have with people. Do you trust a complete stranger with something valuable? No. No. But you would trust someone that you know well if they've earned that trust, right? We can trust God because now we can know God. Because we can be in his presence. We can go directly to him. So we have access to God and that access allows us to trust him. Uh, and this morning I actually have the opportunity, we've got the opportunity to talk to someone who knows about trusting God. Uh, I want to invite Katie Miller up uh, here right now. Uh, if you don't know Katie, Katie and Todd are very close to First Southern Baptist Church of Scottsdale. Katie um, and Todd were here for 13 years. Todd was our student pastor uh, for many, many years. Todd is a personal friend of mine. Uh, I've known him since I moved to Arizona pretty much. Um, and Todd and Katie answered what seemed at the time could be a crazy call uh, to do something that most of us probably, if we were honest with ourselves, probably couldn't do. Katie and Todd answered the call to go be missionaries in Thailand. So they took everything that they had, all their comforts, all the security, and they trusted God in that moment to say, we're going to follow you and do what you want us to do not trust in our own understanding and our own security uh, here in the United States. So, uh, Katie, um, we're talking about trust this morning. And so, can you talk to us a little bit about what role trust played in your and Todd and the kids' journey uh, in going from First Southern Scottsdale to Thailand? Yeah, well, it was all about trust. It still is all about trust because... Let's face it, who wants to live in a culture that they don't understand or a language that they don't understand and food, frankly, that sometimes you don't like? But, um, and going back to your main point, knowing is being able to trust him. If we, when we first started our journey um, about five years ago, Todd and I had to, we heard this calling in our life 
both at the same time. And then we had to dig deeper into our relationship with him. We had to get into the word because really I would say, you want me to take my four little kids where? And at that point we didn't know where, but the more we knew him, the more that we could trust him. So, um, and it was hard to leave this family, you guys, this, um, lots of these faces that I love and some of the new faces that I don't know, but I would love to know. Um, but I remember sitting in the service over in the worship center one Sunday and wrestling with that. God, you want us to leave this family. You want us to leave our, our families in Chandler and Prescott. And why would you do that? We love these people and these people love us. And clear as day, I'm like wrestling with this in my mind. Clear as day, God said, you're not leaving them. They're sending you. And, I, and after I, the service, I told Todd that, and he was like, okay, that's the answer. So, and you guys have done that beautifully. You have sent us, and we feel supported by you. And, but all of that in the trusting, we have to walk in that trust. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about trusting God and then you and Todd and your kids having to make the transition from here to Thailand and what that looked like. And, and, and then, of course, give us an update on how the kids are doing, how Todd's doing. I mean, let's be honest, we'd rather have Katie here rather than Todd, but, um, but we do kind of want to know what, how Todd is doing. So give us an update also on how everyone is. Okay. Well, when we first started the journey, um, we, it was exciting and fun because who wouldn't want to travel the world? Um, but not necessarily with four little kids. That's kind of uh, frustrating, but um, they did great. So we get there, we land, we have a house. Um, we're starting to learn the language, which was, is a whole other story in and of itself. Um, and our first six months there was great, and then I hit the wall of culture shock. And Todd didn't hit his wall until about a year and a half in or so when language really started getting serious. But um, I, as I look back on it, I went through a cycle of grief, grief leaving our family, grief leaving the life that we loved, grief just like, why, God? You know, and the cycle of grief is like, um, you're in denial, so that's kind of the, oh, this is great, this country is wonderful, it, you know, and then you hit anger, and you're like, why? Why did you bring me here? I'm angry at everybody, and I'm angry that I'm angry, and why am I angry? And <laughs> Todd would say to me, are you going to be nice to me today? And I would say, no, leave me alone. <laughs> but, uh, and then after that anger kind of comes a depression where you're just like, Okay, it's hopeless. I'm never going to learn this language. I'm never going to like this food. I'm never, you know, woe is me, poor me. And in those times of anger and grief and depression, I came to the point where I had to literally say to myself out loud multiple times, Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I trust you. Because we have to speak truth into our lives, right? When we're not feeling it, we have to speak it. Um, and we're not, not letting our feelings take us to where Satan would want them to go, but where the truth of who God is, knowing him, is trusting him. So it, it took me about a year and a half to get through that cycle, and everyone goes through it. People all around me say, oh, yeah, I was in that for three years, or I was in that, you know, until even we went to stateside, and I was still angry, and I'm thankful that God brought me out of it. Um, and then after that cycle of grief, then comes hope. And you're like, okay, I can live here. I can thrive. And so I probably went through the most pronounced needing to trust and or maybe the most uh, visual in our family. People outside of our family thought, oh, you guys are settling in great. And I thought, oh, if you could just look inside <laughs> my heart. <laughs> yeah. Our kids settled wonderfully. They're at an international school that just embraced them, and that culture has been really good for them. So um, Jillian is eighth grade. She just turned 14. Isaac is sixth grade. He's 12, just turned 12 this last Tuesday, I think it was. Ace is 10 in fourth grade, and Luke is almost eight next month in second grade. And um, Jillian is probably the most 
uh, outspoken about how much she loves Thailand. And we will be here next uh, spring for six months. And she says, I really want to go to the States, but six months is so long. <laughs> she will miss her friends. And, but they have done great. And Todd, he's great too. He hit his culture wall when he had to, he kind of had some pressure to pass language and he could not pass the silly test. He would take it over and over and just like make it this close. Um, and then once he passed it, it was like this weight lifting off of our house. And then when I passed my language, it was another weight. And then we were like, oh, this is a game changer. Free as a bird. <laughs> yeah. Well, talking about game changers and, and what God has done in the trust you've had with him, um, what ministries are you and Todd and the family involved in? What's going on on that front? Okay. Well, when we hit the ground three and a half years ago, we had the opportunity to get involved in a migrant camp ministry which is um, workers coming over from Burma, trying to find better home, better money, better work situations for themselves and their families. And while their living situations are not better as far as what we would think, it is better than what they came from. So we jumped into that ministry. Um, it was kind of hard because they don't speak Thai and we were learning Thai, um, but the children go to Thai school so we could communicate with the children. Um, and through these last three years, Todd has, through the course of events, taken over that ministry, and we have two locations, and out of that, we have nine national partners. There's six white people on our team and nine national partners, and the relationships that we've built with these national partners and the church that they go to, um, they are one of our home churches. We split our time between an English church and this Thai church, and we just love them. And then the relationship that Todd now has developed with the pastor there, his name is Pastor Nope, and he and Todd, it's actually it's Nopa Chai, but they always shorten it, shorten their names to, to Nope. And <laughs> Todd and Pastor Nope go up into the mountain village about three hours away from our home and connect up with another pastor, John Deep, and they are into a village that has now three believers, and they're working on planting a church there. So it's really exciting because it's, um, you know, missionaries are just everyday people. I am just like you. But when you kind of like read those stories of people who say, I've been waiting for you to come and tell me about Jesus. Todd had that experience a couple months ago. And I was like, Todd? That's like what real missionaries do. You know? <laughs> We're not that, but. <laughs> um, so Todd's working with that pastor and that relationship, and he's really looking to deepen that relationship. And we're looking to um, have a third um, migrant camp ministry, too. That's his goal by the end of the year before we come back to the States. And then my ministry, um, God just like literally, if I could have an hour with you, I'd tell you all the God stories, but dropped the idea of a pregnancy center in my lap. I was sitting with a lady who I had talked with one other time before, and she was telling me all these great things. I had passed language, so now I'm looking for something to fill my time because kids are at school, and I'm just not going to sit home and eat bonbons. So I was meeting with this lady, and she was saying all these cool stories about her ministry, but her team had kind of scattered. God had broken apart her team through people moving and people retiring. And she said, you know, the next thing I want to do is start a pregnancy center. And I was like, oh, that's exciting. And she said, like in the next breath, yeah, but my family and I are moving back to the States and I want you to take over my ministry. And I was like, <laughs> what? So that happened a year ago. And over this past year, it has been my privilege. And I don't know why God chose me, but to watch him build this thing and all the stories it's just amazing like Todd and I'll be sitting on the couch and he's a visionary and he'll be saying oh why don't you do this and this and this and we need to have ultrasound machines and you need to find someone who runs ultrasound machines and then the next day I have coffee with this lady who I've never met before and she says oh I ran ultrasound machines in the states for three years things like that where I don't go looking for these op these encounters they just happen so we're really excited about that because I can identify three pregnancy centers in the whole country of 70 million people. There is none in Chiang Mai of a million people, and Planned Parenthood has been in Thailand for 40 years. 
So we need to start the conversation, the Sanctity of Life conversation, and we're making, we're able to create that conversation. So currently our conversation is starting with every life matters. And if you read in my last um, musings in my kitchen, in the kitchen sink, we just named our ministry the ELM Center, which stands for Every Life Matters. Awesome. So a lot going on in the ministries that Todd and Katie are involved with there in Thailand. Now, there's an exciting opportunity for uh, First Southern to partner with the ministries you have going on, something new that's coming up in August. Can you give us a little snippet of what that is? Yes, we invite you to come and join us for um, August 18th through the 28th to come and work with us, to see where we live, to just hang out with our kids. Um, we would love to have you come and be a part of our lives for a week if you're able. So starting the weekend after Easter, we're going to be doing signups. We're going to take a mission trip to Thailand to where Todd and Katie are at. Uh, we're going to do hands-on ministry with them. Uh, hang out with them, have a great time. It's August 18th through the 28th. Um, and the cost for the trip, which is all-inclusive, it's flight, food, lodging, transportation, whole nine yards, is going to be $1,500 uh, for 10 days uh, in Thailand. And so uh, pray about that. You've got about two weeks before we uh, start signups. Um, and so be praying about whether or not God may be calling you to go. Uh, we would like to take somewhere around six to eight people uh, because that's kind of what we can lodge and transport around uh, the country and the hill country where we'll be going. Uh, so be praying about that, uh, what God may be calling you to do, whether it's go on this trip or maybe God may call you to support someone who uh, is feel called to go. Uh, but I'm excited. I'll be going on the trip myself, and I would love uh, for you guys to come with me and be a part of that. So... Um, so that will, signups for that will start up uh, in two weeks. Now, let's wrap it up. What is the future for the Millers? What's coming up, uh, in, you know, in the next year or so? Well, between now and December, we have a really full calendar. In December, we come back to Arizona for six months. So we'll be here December through the end of May. And we will be here. Um, the most, the majority of that time will be two months in Prescott for May and April and May but the other times we'll be here, and we're really excited. Um, so just some of the things that we're looking forward to on our calendar this next eight months is um, the Tuesday I get back from my trip here in the States. I'm starting a translation project for a post-abortion trauma healing um, curriculum. So one of the God stories in my, on my team is she's Chinese, and she lived under the one-child policy rule, and and then she became a believer and had the opportunity to come to the States where she went through this trauma healing curriculum. So we have the opportunity, we've gotten permission from the publisher to translate this curriculum into Chinese. She will work with another team member who lived in China for 23 years. They'll translate it into Chinese and then I will work with a, a Thai team member and we will translate it into Thai. So I'm just looking forward to what do I need in the future so we can be ready. So we're doing that. Um, and as many of you know, Todd, when he was here, one way that he knows Pastor Chad is by working on Zona staff, um, the summer youth camp. And we, he can't get away from summer camps. <laughs> but we are co-directing a summer camp for our company's children from third to 12th grade. And so that's kind of taking up a lot of our time. And um, Todd's hoping to start this new migrant camp village. Um, we have trainings coming up. And so lots of things happening between now and then. We might move our house. We might, our school is moving into a new location. So lots of things. But yeah. we'll be excited to, I think we're landing um, in Arizona around December 17th or 18th. And we'll be excited to be back here. Awesome. Well, so we've been talking about trust. Um, and obviously, hearing Todd and Katie's story of how they trusted the Lord in a moment when trust seemed kind of crazy uh, might challenge us. Uh, that idea that God, whether you're in a difficult time uh, or you're in suffering, or maybe you're in a great time and God tells you, okay, now I'm going to change that. What is God calling you to trust him in? Is it difficulty that you just need to say, God, 
into your hands I commit this? Uh, is it a good time where God is, you need to tell God, God, whatever it is you want to do, I commit it to you. I trust you in it. Or maybe God is calling you to take a, an amazing, life-changing step. Uh, and if that's you, where do you need to trust him in that? Ultimately, the word faith means trust. The words faith and trust that we translate are the same word in Greek and Hebrew. And so where do you need to have faith? Where do you need to trust God today? Will you join me in prayer?